All right, so it looks like the numbers have started to slow down. So we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you all for joining this session. This is the last session for, for today for the career talks in the nutrition epidemiology and data science. And my name is Kristen Landberg, and I'm a PhD student here at the Freeman School. And I will be co-moderating this, this session with Jesse Lan, who is a master's student at the, at the Freeman School. So we are very excited to be joined by a variety of panelists that are going to share some insight about their careers in nutrition epidemiology and data science and maybe even some deviations <laughs> from, from the original ideas of their studies. So I really look forward to learning from our panelists as well as um, moderating some questions that, that you guys may have. So at any time, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And then I really look forward to, to having a discussion. So I would like to start off and ask um, Dr. Margolis to please feel free to introduce yourself to the group. Hi, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, talk with you all today. My name is Dr. Lee Margolis. I am a nutritional physiologist in the Military Nutrition Division at the United States Army Research Institute of Environmental Physiology. I graduated from the BMN program at Tufts back in 2017. My line of research focuses on how uh, dietary manipulation, uh, exercise manipulation, and environmental exposure uh, will alter dietary requirements, specifically carbohydrate needs of our service members. I make most of my assessments using standard uh, techniques of, uh, sorry, of metabolism, uh, measuring indirect uh, calorimetry, glucose turnover, tracer infusions. Uh, we do muscle biopsies to look at molecular analysis, and then we do some larger high throughput analysis looking at metabolomics and then also uh, gene and microRNA arrays. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you. So Dr. Wynn. I would love for you to introduce yourself as well. Hi everyone, my name is Kim Wen, and uh, I was a Tufts uh, graduate in 2005 and 2006. I'm a double jumbo in the bachelor and MPH program. Um, after graduating, I have worked in government all my life. Um, I spent uh, two years in state government as an epidemiologist. And then um, after that, I worked for 10 years at the CDC. Um, I worked on the COVID response actually. So um, I did a lot of work on uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccination coverage in the United States. And uh, currently I just moved down to Maryland uh, to work at the FDA um, Food and Drug Administration um, on um, tobacco control and research. So I do a lot of uh, regulatory science research now um, looking at uh, tobacco um, use in the US. So um, in my free time, I also, uh, as many of you may see me around, I teach at Tufts as well. And um, I teach survey methods at Tufts. Great, thank you. Lauren. Hi everyone. It's good to see so many familiar faces on the call this evening. Um, my name is Lauren Saladay. I graduated with an MS in biochemical and molecular nutrition from Tufts last May in 2021. Um, and right now I'm working as a food science technologist at a food technology company um, right here in Boston called Motif Foodworks. And what Motif does is we are creating plant-based proteins through a precision fermentation process, as well as other plant-based ingredients to add into um, food products. So what I'm doing right now, my, my lab role as a food science technologist is primarily laboratory based. Um, so a lot of my background is kind of in analytical chemistry. So combining analytical techniques with food science um, to kind of learn a little bit more about how the structure of plant-based proteins impacts its functionality and the sensory products of the final food forms. So kind of doing a little bit of everything, learning on the job, learning lots of new lab te techniques, things like rheology, tribology, which are kind of used in the material science and physics world, which is a lot different than what I originally was studying in my master's program, which was nutrition. So it's been kind of an interesting journey to learn from 
um, a fast growing startup company and what sorts of techniques we can use in the lab to kind of characterize some of these plant-based proteins and food products. So hopefully through our conversations today, like to shed a little light on how a degree from Friedman, nutrition, data science, anything like that can somehow be applied to food industry roles. Great, thanks Lauren. And then last but not least, Case. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. Uh, so I am probably the most out of left field out of all of us. Uh, so I uh, graduated Tufts in the same class as Lauren, 2021. I was in the nutritional epidemiology and data science program. Um, a lot of my focus while I was uh, in graduate school was on um, statistics, programming, um, and sort of data science programming. Um, it was sort of our, my last year was in the interesting year of um, when COVID started popping off. So there was a lot of readily available, um, fast growing data sets that we could work with. Um, and so after graduation, I actually took a job with uh, an industrial part supply company called uh, McMaster Car. Um, so if you've ever done any work in sort of like a, a college engineering, like an engineering building or done any prototyping, you've probably ordered parts from us. Um, we're very much in the, in the business of selling products, selling parts to people who build and break a lot of things. Um, so in, in my company, I work as a systems engineer um, in the security department. Um, so most of my job is uh, sort of like technology help desk um, in sort of like putting out fires with sort of potential security threats and working with a bunch of different security applications um, so that we can essentially just prevent cyber attacks. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of an example of, even though this is, Tufts does a lot of work with nutrition and um, data science, you can kind of just like transfer, transfer a bunch of skills to um, different industries, especially based on um, what skills you want to gain during your um, time at Tufts. So, yeah. That's perfect. So thank you all for those wonderful introductions. And that actually leads me into the first question that I was going to ask the panel to, to really understand what skills are required and or desired in your specific fields. So if anybody wants to go first, feel free just to jump in and just talk about the desired skills. Well, go ahead, Dr. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Sure. So the desired skill set, it, it's going to vary probably a lot. Um, I'm sure everybody here is going to give very different answers on this. And I, I don't even for a uh, for even what I do on a daily basis, I, I don't know if there's necessarily one desired skill set. The biggest thing that I always look for for anyone that I'm trying to bring on board to work on our studies is, is an enthusiasm for the type of work that we're doing. Uh, that's generally the thing that I'm most interested in when talking to candidates who apply for jobs is, are they excited about doing nutrition and exercise physiology research? Do they have some sort of passion for wanting to learn the different types of techniques that we're doing that's either uh, working with our human participants or learning uh, molecular biology, uh, skill sets that we do on a lab in a daily basis. And depending on what type of either technical staff or postdoc we're looking for might determine what, what individual skill set weighs uh, more heavier. If it is working with human subjects or doing the biochemistry type work. Um, but the biggest thing is to just have a, an enthusiasm for the job that you're going into. Yeah, I, I definitely echo that. Um, my company is sort of like a very, we're, we're a very weird case where we we don't hire based on skill, we hire based on essentially like potential. Um, so kind of a lot of it is just seeing like, is getting um, very enthusiastic um, students who like have a track record of being able to learn things on the fly. Um, and kind of like my, my impression of school and, and the job market nowadays is like, it's, it's not enough to, to just do the classes. Um, and 
like you can do all your classes and get A's and stuff, but like just doing the classes kind of shows um, not necessarily at bare minimum, but like I think companies nowadays want to see like, are you doing things outside of your classes? Are you um, learning new skills? Do you have a, a set of hard skills that you've gained? Um, and like, are you leading any sort of student groups or um, any new initiatives? And I think that's kind of like, um, I don't know. I think that's sort of my impression, at least from, from my interview process. So Lauren or Dr. Nguyen, anything, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I can speak a little bit about what it's like to work in a startup environment. And for me, it was kind of a stark transition from being straight, coming straight from school, both undergrad and masters to a startup culture where it's really fast paced and there's very little structure. So an example of that might be like, I don't have projects assigned to me. I create my own projects, design my own experiments, manage all the data. So I think to, to really be successful or to enjoy that sort of culture, um, you have to be good at self-structuring in your own project management, which is definitely a skill that you can evolve in your graduate student studies. If you pick up research positions or try to work in a lab for a little bit, kind of gaining some experience on taking your own initiative, structuring projects, um, sticking to your own timeline. So a lot of those just kind of day-to-day -day skills, I think are really important to work in um, this sort of startup culture. Okay, so this question is more for Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Margolis. So what level of education or certification would you need in, in your current roles? And I ask this because I know that there's a mix of master's and doctoral students on the line. So I'm just curious from, from your perspectives and your current roles, what levels are you of education are you looking for? What levels are we looking for? Like for hiring, like if you have open positions on your team. Yeah, um, so we hire both uh, at the master's level and also at the PhD level for uh, postdoc positions. We hire people or bring new people on through a uh, fellowship program. Um, I work for the army or for the government. Those type of jobs are, are difficult to come by and come with a lot of uh, bureaucracies and a whole assortment of difficulties. Uh, so we typically bring people on through these fellowship programs. I really enjoy uh, bringing people in that way um, because they aren't government employees. The fellowship program is designed for the person to be coming in and learning something. So because I'm the one in charge of the, the fellow, it is my responsibility to make sure that they are learning new skill sets while they're a part of the program. Um, and I take a lot of pride and responsibility in making sure that they are gaining skill sets uh, so they can either roll into a government job or get employment elsewhere. But we, um, we do hire both master's levels who will do more of the daily project coordination type work, uh, scheduling stuff with participants, working with the IRB to submit all of the various IRB forms that you need to help with all of the data collection. And then we uh, hire postdocs as well who oversee the studies and are ultimately responsible for all of the data that is collected for it um, by the technical staff. Great. Um, so we have a couple questions from, from the group. So I'm curious about your experience with work related to co in response to COVID-19. So just out of curiosity, Dr. Margolis, is, is there anything in, in your world that could also answer that question? Uh, for a data repository? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we have um, a couple of large data sets that the military uses. Um, there, um, there's a, a data repository for just overall health information for soldiers. So it looks at things uh, like injury, how often people are getting sick, things like that. So scientists can go in and they can data mine that to try to understand um, you know, how likely people are to get injured or have any other negative consequences, maybe in and around some of the training that they're doing as part of their military occupation. 
Uh, our group is starting to build some uh, large nutrition data sets. So we've done a lot of studies where we go out to um, initial military training sites and we'll have the, uh, the newly minted soldiers fill out uh, block FFQs before their training and then they'll do their training for a couple of months. They'll, they'll go and they'll fill it out afterwards. And we did this a lot for a bunch of individual studies for a number of years. And our PIs realized that maybe we should start pooling all of this information together because we have the dietary intake data. We have a lot of blood analyte data from them and we always assess body composition and we get um, physical training scores from the courses that they do themselves. So we are starting to build some of those, those type of things. That's very useful. Thank you so much. And again, to the to the group, feel free if you guys have questions for the specific speakers or for all of the speakers, please don't be shy and put those in the chat. It would be great to involve the group in, in this conversation, in this conversation as well. So I have a question, again, another question for all, all four of you. So again, you can take time to, to answer. So where do you see the trends in your current role? Like where do you see your role evolving to in the next few years? So Case, start with you. Yeah, um, so like I said, my company is kind of just weird in that we don't really um, hire based on skills and you're not siloed into sort of like one track. Like I'm in security right now, but I could easily transfer in say like a year into applications development. Um, I don't know how many people at, at Tufts would be interested in cybersecurity, but it's it's a huge field um, with a whole lot of potential given current events and um, just like the increasing potential for um, cyber attacks growing. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of uh, it's interesting to to sort of present to a nutrition audience, but um, essentially career growth for me looks sort of just like moving into um, either a more skilled role in, um, we have like a lead systems engineer, which would essentially just be like my job, but then I'd be managing multiple other systems engineer or systems engineers are moving into like a project manager role, um, which would be essentially what it sounds like just having a bunch of people, um, who I'm responsible for having their work output increased. Um, if, if someone was interested in, in some sort of position like this, it's, Again, the skills get, skill sets mainly just like having a having an appetite to learn, um, maybe some some technology skills in the back, and just like having a proven track record of um, working on projects with a lot of people with a lot of ambiguity. Um, and so I would say like just sort of throwing yourself off into the deep end as soon as possible uh, while you're at Tufts would be extreme, just like invaluable because the more time you have working on projects, um, the more attractive that is for for companies like mine. Awesome. Lauren, what are your thoughts? So I am sort of in the unique position where I kind of got to actually mold my own job and my own job description and day-to-day -day activities, which is something really special and kind of unexpected for me for my first job out of grad school. Um, but when I joined the company, the food science team was only two other, un other individuals plus myself. So there was a lot of work to do and a lot of ideas being floated around. Um, and so I really got to kind of jump in. And initially, the first couple months on the job, I kind of played to my strengths, which was um, developing analytical methods. So techniques like HPLC, UVVis, SDS page, if anyone's familiar with kind of some protein chemistry, but things like that I've done in previous roles before. So I was able to kind of quickly jump in, develop some methodologies. And then from there, once I was kind of a little more comfortable, a little more comfortable with the company, um, I decided to branch out and to learn some new techniques, um, as well as become a little bit more ingrained with some of our university partnerships. So something that's unique about Motif Foodworks is that we're really trying to take a science first approach to developing plant-based foods. So we have collaborations with just over 10 universities um, worldwide. So Australia, UK, and then some local universities like UMass Amherst. So being able to join Zoom calls with these collaborators and 
learn projects that they're working on um, has been super interesting for me in terms of learning about all of these other um, techniques that go into the development of a food product. So initially, I guess, like playing to my strengths and then jumping in to like learn new things, new techniques is what's really keeping me engaged with what I'm doing is being able to, to learn and grow and expand and also kind of like figure out what I want to do, where I want to go. There's lots of room for growth. I forget what the original question was, but that, <laughs> there goes my rant. No, I think that that's perfect. And Dr. Magos, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I just like to echo what Lauren said about um, expanding your horizons and some of the things that you're working on and thinking about. Um, so like when I started, most of the things that I would primarily do in my studies were the stuff that I knew, uh, having people exercise do, using indirect calorimetry. Uh, we would add some uh, isotope methodologies to that. And then we would do standard uh, molecular biology techniques, Western blotting, PCR, and that would kind of be it. And we could show that things would go up and go down in our human participants, but you know, we would never really be able to get at a mechanism because it's a person, so you can't like knock out a gene in the body. But what we've been trying to do more lately is dig a little bit deeper and try to really understand what's going on uh, with the different interventions that we're employing and um, either by adding larger data sets where we can get more information about the individual and dig down into some mechanistic explanations, uh, particularly with metabolomics or with transcriptomics right now. And then also pairing up uh, cell culture models with our human studies so we can then do some of those experiments where we're either transfecting or knocking down specific targets that we see change in our participants. So we can get a, a better understanding of the biology behind all of it. So taking the, the skills that you learn at school, but then also looking at what other people are doing and trying to, to expand your knowledge base is definitely very important and uh, vital to stay relevant as a scientist. Great, I think that you guys all covered on, on multiple topics that even expanded outside of the, the original question, because I think it's important whenever you start look for jobs to obviously continue to stretch and grow in your current position. And then sometimes also, if you guys agree with me, feel free to chime in. When you're applying for a job, like you're obviously applying for one specific job, but it could also be useful to think about what your next job would be at that company and then what your next job would be at that company, right? So you almost have an idea of a roadmap of where you want to be. Um, so what do you guys think about, about that statement? Do you guys agree? Any thoughts on that? I think you could probably extend that sort of framework to just being in uh, in grad school right now, because um, I guess sort of my my strategy when I was in grad school is sort of like you can just do a quick search through LinkedIn for like job titles that you'd be interested in, um, and then just sort of looking down sort of a list of like what are the sort of like the required skill sets or um, skills that they're looking for, and then sort of just building your learning. Um, building your learning off of something like that like for example all the jobs I, were, I was looking at was like proficiency with um working with data working in like a statistical software language like r python um just sort of picking off those skills and saying like okay in my time here i want to learn these skills so that when it comes time to apply for these jobs i will have these skills under my belt um and obviously you can like once you get into a job that that doesn't really change it's kind of just like all right now i need people management skills so i need to work on that where are some areas where i can actually like work with people or direct people's work or something like that so i think sort of taking that like checklist approaches um it served me well all right any other thoughts or comments on that because we have I do see another question in the, in the chat. So it appears that most of the positions in nutrition and exercise epidemiology are in the Northeast. In the future, do you think that there will be more opportunities in other areas of the country? And if you have experience that there's other, um, currently other jobs outside of the Northeast, feel free to let everybody know about that too. And then Dr. Margolis, just your, your thoughts on geographic location. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are other positions outside of 
the Northeast, we are certainly densely populated. So maybe there are you know, more opportunities there. It, it, it's a lot of it'll come back and depend on, on what you're really looking for. Um, just from the military's perspective, they are integrating uh, our type of healthcare more with uh, soldiers uh, through um, this program called uh, uh, Healthy Human Factors, H2F. Uh, so they're really starting to understand that they should be treating service members more like uh, elite athletes where you have dietitians, you have strength and conditioning coaches, occupational therapists, and physical therapists working with a unit or a grade level on a daily basis. So you have this kind of integrative care team that is with them. And this is throughout the United States. So if I know there's some, some MSRD overlap here. So for dietitians, this is you know, an exciting and interesting opportunity. If the sports nutrition world is something that you're interested in, uh, working one-on-one -on -one with service members and then also like leading classes and, and group discussions and things like that. So there's a lot of opportunities out there now, uh, especially, you know, the more people start to understand what a vital role nutrition plays in sports performance, the, the bigger this field has become, uh, especially over the past decade uh, since I've been doing this. Okay. A uh, quick question for, for the group again. So I would love to hear what you feel like is the most rewarding part of your job as well as the most challenging part of your job. So Lauren, let's start with you. Yeah, so challenging, I would have to say, can sometimes be the lack of structure. Just being in the startup environment, there are things um, that are changing every day. It can feel disorganized at times. Getting people to make a quick decision can be tough just because there aren't really those kind of hierarchical organizational structures in place um, that a lot of you know, medium to large size companies do have. So at times that can be frustrating um, just to kind of learn how to deal with it and to put systems in place to make, to make work more efficient for everybody. Um, but on the rewarding end, I'd have to say it's being able to see kind of immediate results of my work. So even in just my first couple months here, I've contributed to FDA petitions for grass proposals. So generally regarded as safe for some of our ingredients. I've contributed to a patent publication and also to a research paper. So just kind of these cool milestones that I've been able to see output of my work so quickly has been pretty rewarding. All right, so just curious, Dr. Margolis, same same question from a, a government, I'm sure, perspective. Yeah, There's a so lot more. probably anyone who works in the government will tell you that the most frustrating part is the bureaucracy of it. Um, you know, I can't just go and buy something. It has to go through a very long contracting process if it costs more than a certain dollar amount. Um, same thing with contracting out services to be rendered. Uh, so over the years, I've been able to learn how to manage my time to ensure that like, okay, I know we're gonna finish this study in three months. So I need to start writing this contract so we can get our data analyzed. Um, so things can get held up if you're not proactive in understanding how long things are going to take to get done in a timely manner. Um, this also sometimes can uh, hold us up for trying to get new technologies or software in the door. Uh, a lot of our IT department can be wary about uh, new technology. Certainly anything open like R becomes difficult because like anybody can interact with it. So you have to be very careful from a security standpoint that you're not just opening this up to anyone to get into your system. So there's a lot of things that, you know, we have to deal with on a daily basis that could seem like it's, it's inhibiting us from being able to do our job because there's all of these security measures in place. Um, and you want to make sure that you know you're spending the government's dollars fairly so that's why there's these long contracting processes but again like if you're not planning for these things ahead of time they can really derail your projects 
so that's probably the most frustrating. Uh, the most rewarding is is been seeing uh, the people under me be successful. Uh, right before this call, one of our postdocs who ran a study for me, she just informed me that she won or she's a finalist for the uh, Gatorade Sports Science Institute Young Investigator Award. So that is definitely probably the happiest that I've, I've ever been in this position. So I'm just very, very happy for her. And it's very rewarding as a mentor to see people uh, under you succeeding and, and getting great opportunities like that. All right, so to break up the maybe government issues, Case, what about you? <laughs> uh, just uh, going back to sort of like the, the blocking R and um, <laughs> It's funny is that uh, Dr. Margolis, I think I'm part of the team in my company that is the cause of those frustrations, um, which is kind of funny, but uh, in all seriousness, so one of the, the frustrations of my job, and I think most uh, private sector jobs, um, is that a lot of times uh, you don't really get to choose your own work. A lot of the work that you do is sort of things that the company needs to get done or um, things that your boss needs to get done. Um, and so I think, uh, like obviously with graduation, there's a lot of consideration with like having a job that can help pay down student loans and um, give you a comfortable living. But I think uh, one thing that shouldn't be that like can't be stressed enough is um, finding a job where you'll you'll have work that's extremely interesting to you. Um, maybe not all the time, but at least it'll have some reward because I think a lot of times people get sort of caught up on the dollar amount once they they have an offer. Um, so yeah, that's sort of one of the frustrations uh, of the job sometimes is that you don't always get to work on projects that interest you. Um, on the other hand, it is still rewarding because uh, a lot of times in a company you'll work with a lot of really um, smart, intelligent people who are extremely driven um, and you can get a lot of work done on say like a, an extremely interesting project. Like my project was, one of my projects was essentially uh, automating um so whenever we have a security threat come in i wrote a powershell script that automates essentially taking the computer off the network and isolating it um so that attacks can't progress and so like once you sort of go through a project and see the end result and continue to work on it it's kind of like your baby and it's it's very rewarding to see that succeed um so yeah i think yeah just going from that project work uh in itself is very rewarding even if it's not necessarily exactly the thing that you want to do Great, so I have another question for Dr. Zwen and Dr. Margolis, since you've been in your positions for a little bit longer than Lauren and Case. So what would you say has been the greatest change in your current role since you started in your position? I think you just called us old, but- No, 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 we'll just more work experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what has changed in, in my role? And I think most, you know, benchtop scientists roles as they progress through their career is that I'm no longer like in the laboratory on a day-to-day -day basis like I was as a postdoc. Like when I when I started off, it was, you know, working with our human participants, getting the samples, then being in the lab and analyzing all of the data myself and then writing up the papers and moving on to the next one. Um, as I've been in my position and in this field for a while now, I've started to expand my team where I have technicians who you know, specifically help me with exercise components, generating study diets, and doing the um, molecular analysis of the blood and muscle samples that we collect. And I'm in continually kind of moving farther and farther away from the analysis and data collection part of it and more on the uh, writing and just continuing to get funding to bring more people in to do more work. So I've become more, more managerial than, um, you know, hands-on with everything. Great. So I have one more question and then I know um, I have another question from, from the group. So my last question for all four of you is what is the most unexpected thing, either good or bad, in your transition from academia into work? And then how did you adapt, depending if it was good or bad? Um, I'll start, I think. 
Uh, it's definitely the ambiguity. Um, it's it's kind of one thing that sort of catches you by surprise a lot is that once you're you're sort of working on a project team and either like a private or public company, you're it's not like a it's not like a problem set that you would get in an epidemiology class. It's very much like a here's sort of like the expected outcome or the desired outcome or solution, and you just have to find a way to get there. Um, so yeah, it's I guess adapting to that is just sort of um in in grad school i wasn't a great planner um so like i wasn't very much like the type of person who's like here's my goal here's sort of like what i need to do to get here is like here's my goal i'm gonna aimlessly wander about until i get there um but i guess starting a job now and we have a little bit of help from from sort of managers and higher ups with how to complete our projects but um you really need to be a lot more organized and to have some direction um, and to sort of be able to pivot if if your direction isn't going the way you want it to, um, but yet there's a ton of ambiguity once you once you enter the workforce, um, and you're going to have to learn how to deal with it. For me, mine's a positive one: having a better work life balance now than I did in grad school. So having free weekends where I truly, truly don't think about work at all. And I think that's totally situational and dependent on where you're working, what you're doing. But that was probably the most dramatic change for me is, is having that improved work-life balance. All right, Dr. Wendner, Dr. Margolis, any thoughts? Yeah, I guess not to uh, pile up on school too much here, but you get a lot more enjoyment in work um, compared to school because you, you you school you're doing things to get a to get a good grade or to get the project done which is you know all fine and things that you need to do but you know when you're in your job especially if you're in a job that you like and you're passionate about when you do things um, that are self-driven and that they are successful you just get so much more enjoyment out of that because it isn't it isn't just simply to get a grade it's you know, for me, it's getting a data set done, writing a paper and putting that out into the world is, you know, it's very rewarding. School is good too, though. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, any other questions from, from the audience? Feel free to put them in the chat. All right, so I don't see any other any other questions in, in the chat. So I just wanted to thank our panelists. I think this was a great opportunity to really learn about lots of things about your different careers. And honestly, some of the really exciting things that can be done with the degrees that we are pursuing pursuing from, from Tufts. So with that, if Jesse or Alina, if you have any closing thoughts, I welcome you to unmute yourselves and say anything. I'm going to ask a question uh, <laughs> since since I'm so glad to see all of you um, and it, it's it's actually really wonderful to, to hear your perspective, but I'm wondering, um, you know, being in school, it's not only about academia. I'm curious about if anything of uh, what was the most valuable experience you brought from the graduate school to your life, to your workplace outside of academic courses. I can always count on Alina for the tough questions. So who wants to go first? <laughs> um, I, I can start. So uh, I learned a lot of uh, creativity in grad school and getting my, my projects done in the lab, especially if something wasn't working out and learning how to troubleshoot to get assays to work or get experiments running um, and really starting to use you know that part of my brain where it's it's about you know the what's the data telling you and how can you be creative with that data to let it tell the best story that it has to tell i think um one of 
one of the experiences from grad school that actually stuck with me, Elena, was the the first time I had a conversation with you in your office. And it was very jarring because uh, I think the, the question that you asked me that I didn't know how to answer and I was kind of stuttering at the time, you asked, uh, what skills do you have? And I, at that point, I was like trying to come up with certain things and I'm like, oh, for my undergrad, I guess I can read scientific papers and I can code a little bit in MATLAB. But um, besides that, it was sort of hard to lay things out. And so I think um, it's it's very valuable to sort of um, take a little bit of time to to sort of tune out from from the world and sort of have a, an honest conversation with yourself about like, okay, where do I want to be in a couple of years? What skills do I want? Um, what do I want to do? Um, as opposed to sort of just going with the flow, because it's, it's very easy once, say, the semester and classes start, or like once you're in a job to sort of just go with the flow and not think too much about it. But I think taking time to take a step back and be like, all right, am I doing exactly what I want to do? Um, are there things that I could be learning or skills that I could be gaining? Um, that I could be taking time outside of my normal work day and going outside of the flow um, to sort of gain. Um, and I think that actually helped me a lot in graduate school and, and also right now. Um, so that's my takeaway. Well, I couldn't say it any better than Case just said it. It's really, it can be really difficult at times to kind of remove yourself from your normal daily activities and kind of disrupt the flow but a lot of times in those moments is when you have the best clarity and can think about really what you've done, what you wanna do, how can you get to that next level? So I think what Case said is totally spot on. No, thank you very much. You, you answered beautifully on my question. You passed another exam and it was so wonderful to see you all. Um, and, and, and I hope we will see each other you know, more frequently. So. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing your experience. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and have a good evening. See you later. Thanks, everyone.